Robert Tsai, I am so happy to be here with you and to celebrate your new and important book on practical equality, a book for our time, because you really take on the question, how can we make progress when it's not a very propitious time for doing so? So I had a question for you, which is, what do you think have been the most successful ways to make progress on equality when there's opposition? Well, it's, it's great to be with you, Martha, as well. And congratulations to you on the um, publication of your uh, wonderful book. Um, at, you know, in terms of answering your question, um, what I've tried to do in the book is to uh, highlight what we might describe as certain kinds of mindsets, um, good habits, uh, for those who might believe in equality and want to make progress on equality. And um, among those habits and mindsets that I try to focus on is uh, an ability to, to see through the, uh, the various trees and focus on what I describe as um, the unequal harms that certain populations might experience. And if we keep that in mind, uh, then I think that we'll be more open to a variety of techniques that we might be willing to use, a number of ideas that we might be willing to use, whether those ideas are equality itself or fairness uh, or uh, finding ways to reduce cruelty that have some connection with equality. Um, that's, that's the main thing that I focus on to try to bring the idea of equality kind of, kind of down to earth, uh, away from the more lofty abstractions that we often sort of get stuck in uh, when we uh, talk about it as first principles. So helpful. And really, you're speaking to uh, people about practice, how to engage in strategies and tactics, but also communication in courts, out of courts. Um, one of my next questions is you, you talk about second best solutions. When should we turn to second best solutions and what's an example of one? That's a great question. Um, in my view, um, someone who believes in equality really should be thinking uh, on multiple planes at the same time, right? That we, we each of us as individuals, as groups, as members of society have our own preferred vision for what a just society looks like, a, 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 an equal society where everybody has a, has a role in it. Um, but it turns out that we all have very different notions of what that might look like. Um, and, um, you know, what I try to, uh, you know, what I try to emphasize is that we have to have that, that sort of first order vision of what uh, we prefer. Um, but we also have to think hard about um, what we're willing to tolerate as a sort of second best outcome, some sort of halfway point or maybe even a series of halfway points that we're willing to accept as progress or what we might call good progress um, that lifts some of these unequal burdens that, uh, you know, let's say you, you do work for the um, immigrant population that has lately been experiencing a number of um, uh, excessive sort of burdens that they, ex they, they have to shoulder alone, that there are places along the path to this better um, vision of society where we can accept that, that this will do some good for that community. And we have to think hard about both of these things at the same time, right? Our first preferred vision of what an equal society looks like, as well as a, a set of things that we're willing to accept and then build on. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I really sort of try to focus on, the kind of two-tiered approach to thinking about um, a, a strategy and outcomes. Very helpful. And, and to find that sometimes when the path is blocked on an equality argument, you may succeed in talking about cruelty or talking about fairness or, or uh, pushing on another door. Absolutely. And, and I think this is a, a place where it actually um, potentially dovetails with, with your own work uh, on forgiveness. Um, and I've got some, some questions that, that maybe come along these lines, uh, but you know, a lot of what I try to accomplish in the book is to try to show how some of these ideas like equality and dignity and fairness and anti-cruelty have some overlap. And that um, as lawyers, as activists, even as judges, if you believe in equality, you can sort of leverage um, th these areas of overlap to do some good to make some progress. It's not perfect. The ideas are, are different for a reason. Um, and you can't always do it. Um, but um, 
one way of thinking about what I'm doing though is, um, and here's where it connects to what I think you're up to to some extent, is that if we care about building a culture um, that broadly respects rights, that broadly cares about the community as well as the individual um, participants in that community, um, then we, we have to think about how these ideas, these many different ideas come together. Um, and um, I, I see your book actually, um, which focuses on forgiveness as perhaps um, a kind of global way of thinking about how um, ideas of equality and dignity and uh, perhaps anti-cruelty might come together in a way that we can judge when we might be doing something good, right? Where we might be doing something for the individual in the community. So I want to ask you about that uh, um, more specifically, right? Um, how do you see your nation, your notion of a kind of forgiveness-based law or legal order, uh, and and how that relates to these other sort of separate concepts that that I talk about? Well, thank you for that, and I do see some connections. Uh, I think we are both interested in standing back from the details of doctrine and really asking about how we can live together in ways that respect each other's dignity and deal with the inevitable and sometimes tragic uh, conflicts that we experience. I, I don't really advocate in my book, When Should Law Forgive? Replacing all of law with forgiveness. But I do advocate the development of a kind of jurisprudence of forgiveness, that we need to be more systematic in our thinking and teaching and using forgiveness in the legal system, just as we do in our daily lives. We let go of warranted, justified grievances with people we know, with strangers, uh, and it's a way that we function together. And the legal system has mechanisms for doing that, but they aren't often uh, systematically pursued. And it, often there's even a risk of new kinds of discrimination. Who actually gets a pardon, for example, from the president of the United States or from a governor? We don't really have systematic ways of talking about that. And therefore it may be a reflection of bias or who's a friend or who has power. And I disagree with that because I think the pardon power is a great example of taking advantage of this alternative approach. Okay, we see a wrong, we acknowledge the wrong, now we wanna move forward and give someone a second chance, the same way we do with bankruptcy. One of the most powerful aspects of, uh, of your book that I found was um, when you got into this, this discussion about pardons, um, complexities involved with pardons, uh, particularly if you wanted to have a kind of forgiveness-based way of thinking through pardons. And um, you talk about pardons that can be abused, for example, uh, for corrupt reasons, um, but also pardons that might um, induce or invite a uh, kind of lawlessness and defiance of the law. And then you, you devote a special section, of course, to uh, President Trump's pardon of Sheriff uh, Joe Arpaio. And I wanted, to, I wanted to probe you a little bit about that because um, you know, a, a lot of the things that you said in that section really, uh, really resonated with me. Um, but uh, you know, you sort of contrast um, the kinds of legal defiance that that Sheriff Arpaio engaged in, for example, uh, flouting um, judicial decrees, um, uh, 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 you know, mistreating uh, 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 migrants. Uh, by warehousing them in concentration camps and various things like that, right? Race-based roundups, all these kinds of awful things that he did. Um, and you contrast that with say a, a legal defiance, a kind of, I guess maybe na more narrow form of civil disobedience that might be more worthy of, uh, of a pardon. Is that, is that sort of where you're going with that? So thank you for that question. Uh, I, when President Trump used his, his uh, pardon power the first time to excuse Sheriff Apayo, who was himself found to have violated federal law and was held in contempt of court. So the pardon was to relieve the contempt of court. It's entirely different than someone who isn't a public official, has not been subject to a court order, is not defying what a court has said. And so I do contrast uh, the, his, his treatment with, for example, you know, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who did it, uh, pursue civil disobedience 
and even accepted punishment, but made arguments about why the laws were wrong. Of course, he wasn't in power. He was trying to expose the abuses of power, whereas Arpaio is in power and he's abusing people daily. Uh, and he certainly was while he had that office. I do think that it's striking that other countries have come up with ways to deal with a pardon power and not leave it in the hands of one person. So South Africa, for example, allows for judicial review of a pardon power. Many countries that have the pardon power actually make it a recommendation or a decision by a group. Um, I really worry that uh, you know when we have a president who says he could pardon himself, um, that there should be some limits and we need to confine uh, that kind of limit. And at the same time, I do think that there are governors who do not adequately use their power to commute sentences, uh, to expunge the records of a minor who committed an offense before reaching the age of 18. We should give people a second chance when they have actually um, either shown that they have turned a new leaf or time has passed and the whole world can get on. Now, one of the things that you, you point out over and over in your book um, about people, let, let's call them people who are worthy of being uh, forgiven, that, that there's something that the individual should have to do. Uh, for example, you talk about um, they have to be truthful, they have to be willing to be accountable. And then the idea of remorse comes up over and over as um, a way of showing that someone is worthy of forgiveness. Um, in Joe Arpaio's case, in the case of uh, Roger Stone, uh, in the case of uh, Eddie Gallagher, the, uh, the soldier who was, who was pardoned, um, it seems to me that these are moments when um, the opposite is true, right? That, that these are figures who have shown no remorse. And, 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 and I guess this is what connected to what you're worried about, that uh, forgiving somebody without having gone through the paces to show that they are worthy um, does something to them or maybe doesn't do enough to them um, and, and also does something to the community. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, thank you for that. You know, I think one, one point of real convergence in our books is trying to articulate norms that don't fall into the polarized context of our current day. Uh, and uh, I do think that the notion of uh, someone taking responsibility for whatever they did that was wrong and saying, I now want to be different, that's not a partisan view. Uh, and people commit wrongs from all different walks of life. And every society, every civilization of human beings has come up with mechanisms for forgiveness uh, through time. And ours has, but I think has inadequately used it. We are living in a society that has the highest rate of incarceration in the criminal justice system in history. And the pendulum has swung too far. I think it needs to come back. So I put the question back to you. How can your approach to equality avoid the polarization of our time? Yeah, it, that's a wonderful question. It's a hard, it's a hard one to answer. Um, uh, I, I actually think that uh, thinking along the lines that you've been pushing us to think about forgiveness as a virtue that we should inculcate uh, among decision makers, people in power, people who are proximate to authority, uh, but also among citizens, right, uh, is um, a very valuable one. Uh, for me, the mindset that is important um, to kind of reducing inequality uh, has to do with becoming flexible, uh, you know, has to do with uh, appreciating that uh, none of us can kind of do this on our own, that even though we see models of that and we're being told through our politics, through the, polit the unforgiving politics um, uh, of say tough on crime, uh, then tough on drugs and tough on terrorism that, that you, you talk about in your own book. Um, although we see those models um, that lead us to this bad place where we have rampant inequality as well as um, uh, unforgiving policies, um, I think that um, coming up with uh, models where people have to acknowledge that they have to work together, that they have to find people uh, as much as possible where they are, 
um, is important. And that's why, for example, uh, one of my favorite uh, cases, I, of course, I don't talk about this until the very end, but um, is um, the case of uh, NAACP versus Button, um, you know, a case that uh, came out of uh, the uh, incredibly controversial uh, desegregation efforts led by the Supreme Court, right? Um, first initiated at a time when the nation as a whole had not gone through uh, the civil rights revolution uh, to the point where a majority of Americans uh, was truly uh, backing the notion of racial equality. And um, what the court was met with, of course, was uh, massive defiance. And uh, in that particular case, a series of cases, really, you had states trying to frustrate Right, the enforcement of, of Brown versus Board of Education by passing a whole bunch of laws, and, including laws that made it harder for public interest lawyers um, to take cases of this sort. And um, the restriction there, it's, and it's so fascinating to me, um, for a few of the justices, uh, including Earl Warren, um, uh, and inc including uh, Justice Brennan, this was a slam dunk, right? This was a clear defiance of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on equality. Of course, they have a very robust notion of equality to start with, so they were predisposed to see it that way. But the problem was, was that that position could never get a majority of the court. And Frankfurter, who was ever the formalist and uh, much more worried about, right, reconciling notions of, you know, judicial minimalism and democracy, uh, wasn't willing to sign on to that approach. And, you know, his position was, look, we've allowed states like Virginia to regulate the practice of law since the beginning of time. And um, if, you, if you stick the notion of equality into this arena, um, it's going to be so disruptive, it might create a, a further backlash. Um, and uh, so, so what I love about this moment, as difficult as it was, um, was that the court understood what we might call the egalitarian stakes, right? That if they allowed Virginia, if they allowed other states to find ways to defy um, the idea of equality, then um, this whole idea would come to an end. This whole experiment would come to an end pretty quickly, right? Um, the NAACP, the ACLU activists could no longer push this idea. Courts could no longer enforce it. Uh, in their courtrooms. Um, and so they understood the stakes and yet they also understood that they could not force the issue in the way that several of them saw it. Um, and the big breakthrough moment in their conversations among themselves uh, is um, to, to try to reconceptualize um, the problem as a free speech one. And that's, and, and although we we now look at that case today, right, as this ringing, First Amendment uh, uh, case where you know the court says um, you know uh, public interest litigation is a kind of political advocacy. We got to protect it in the same way that we protect the person standing on a you know on a soapbox in the street. Um, you know what's most interesting is it didn't start out that way, right? And it needed a kind of reframing uh, of the problem in order to to kind of peel up off uh, uh, enough people. To the, to the side of things uh, where we can avoid a terrible inegalitarian outcome, um, but also have some set of ideas that we can build on. Uh, and that's why I love that case so much is that uh, they found another way to deal with the problem. It certainly isn't perfect. I mean, you can come up with a list of at least 10 reasons why it's not perfect. It's not enough. But we've also always recognized that there is a connection between recognizing one's ability to speak, particularly dispossessed groups that are trying to promote social change uh, and equality itself. And I think it's, you know, that's, that's such a rich moment, um, uh, I think, for us to kind of go back to when we, uh, when we struggle and, and um, uh, about pushing the ball forward. It's, it's a wonderful description of uh, such a critical case. And it really reminds me of a way of thinking about justice as a big room. And there are different doors into this room. And, uh, but it's all the same room. Uh, and, you know, there's a way in which conceiving of that problem in free speech terms uh, allows for reinforcement of the legal order itself uh, in a way that I think Justice Frankfurter was worried would be in jeopardy if it was put into an inequality frame. Um, I think that both of us are, are urging people to think about the relationship between social movements 
and groups on the one hand and individual moral outrage on the other. And one of my efforts, therefore, is to take the idea of restorative justice seriously mm -hmm. and to locate responsibility, even when we have a criminal offense, certainly when we have debt, uh, in not just the behavior of an individual. Certainly individuals do uh, make critical choices that uh, violate norms, that violate promises, but it's in part of larger communities. And the, those communities and those interrelationships are both causes and potential solutions going forward. And, and that's something that I really um, see in your work as well and thinking about social movements and groups uh, that are all working uh, alongside each other. Absolutely. I mean, you do this so beautifully in, uh, in the first part of your book where you use the example of uh, child soldiers and uh, pe you know, people who are, are, are very young, not fully formed when they're uh, forced to do ex excruciating and horrible things. Um, uh, and um, you know, how, to, how to deal with them, how to uh, reintegrate them back into community. I see this as a, a theme running throughout your book that, um, and it's connected to some of the things that I worry about too in our polarized time, which is, um, it's important to fight for outcomes like justice and equality, but we all have to be able to live together in the end. And we have to find ways to be able to uh, have a community after our fighting and arguments uh, have ended. And, and the thing that we live in, the community that we live in still has to be one that's worth living in. Um, it has to be the kind of community that, um, that we can still look up to, that we can still envision lasting for more than uh, the particular moment um, that we're, where we're sort of fighting. Um, so I think, you know, I think your book, uh, you know, really just beautifully uh, dramatizes that with not just the child soldier uh, uh, situation, but also with, uh, with the forgiveness of debt, right? One of the things that we truly are grappling with as a nation right now, and you go through a number of, the, uh, of these examples, is uh, what devastating debt from um, uh, things like healthcare expenses, uh, from student loans. And there's a lot of complicated reasons for why we're at, the, at this place where that's a major underlying source of, of our inequality. But you know, being able to get to a place where we can all still live together, the people who are in debt and the people who are owed debt seem to be, seems to be uh, a, a very important theme that runs through your book. Well, thank you. And that was a beautifully said. Uh, you know, I do think about what it is about the situation of child soldiers that attracts a notion of forgiveness when in this country we're less forgiving of juvenile offenders here who may similarly have been conscripted in their local communities to engage in the drug trade. And so in my own uh, work, I try very hard to look at comparisons and try to learn from them. And, and why do we have a vocabulary of turning the page, wiping the slate clean in bankruptcy, and we don't do it as well in criminal justice. And I see you doing something very similar when you take equality, but then you say, well, but there's another way to talk about it. How about fair play? Or how about anti-cruelty? Uh, there's another way, let's do a comparison. When we do a comparison, we actually can see the problem in a different light. Absolutely, and, and that helps us to think about the comparative trade-offs, right? That, that and, and this is, I think, something that activists instinctively often have to deal with. Um, uh, lawyers too, but, the, but, but the, 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 the sense of exigency can be different, right? The, the kind of resources that we, we have access to might be very different, but, um, uh, but it, is a, it is a constant, um, set of considerations, right? We can, we can characterize a problem this way, we can characterize a problem this other way. If neither is perfect, um, either way will have some um, costs uh, and some benefits. And uh, we have to be able to think along these multiple trajectories at the same time before we can evaluate, um, you know, what's a good temporary outcome on this path to a better place. What do you think is one thing that every law student and indeed every member of our society ought to know about law and its relationship to equality at this moment? Well, I, I think that um, this is something that I've tried to stress in all of my work is that um, 
we, we tend to, for a lot of complicated psychological educational reasons, focus on rules and focus on institutions, which are very important uh, to a society that is healthy, a democracy that works. Um, but I actually try to emphasize in my work um, to think about the tradition as a whole, that we're all part of a larger tradition, a tradition that has changed over time, a tradition that has been deeply contested. And so when we look at rules and we look at institutions, there's no way for us to truly evaluate how those things are doing, how those things are working, unless we understand the broader tradition as well as the history that sort of got us to a particular moment in the first place. And I actually think that that is something that informs uh, your own work and, 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 and your book that uh, we, we have to think uh, more holistically, right? We have to have um, a broader understanding of the, of the virtues we want to inculcate, the kind of culture uh, of forgiveness that uh, we, we want to have uh, in a society that we think is you know, worth living in. Well, I do think uh, that our institutions and our laws, after all, reflect values. And the values uh, are still a way to hold those institutions and those laws accountable. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, let's hope that they represent a commitment to re respect the dignity of each human being and the possibility of thriving in society. And we need rules and we need predictability and we need equal treatment. But if all of those rules and institutions stand in the way of creating a good society, then that's a moment to rethink. Um, I did have a question for you about that. Um, and, and that is this, uh, there's, a, there's a way to read your wonderful book uh, in which what you seem to be saying is, is that what we need to do a better job of is to make our law, our rules, our institutions um, more reflective of the, of, the, of the virtue of forgiveness. Um, uh, and that suggests though, that um, we should sort of tinker with things and redesign things in a way. Um, and then what's most important uh, is opportunities uh, for forgiveness, right? Opportunities for reintegration and so forth and accountability. There's another way to sort of read um, your book at times, which is that uh, when you talk about the unforgiving state of our law, the unforgiving state of our politics, um, it's, is that we, we, in a kind of quantitative way, we need more forgiveness. We don't have enough forgiveness, right, in the world. Um, uh, and it's that sheer amount of, uh, or the sheer absence of forgiveness, perhaps, that is really marking us as a society today. That suggests, though, on that reading, that the, you know, designing the institutions isn't enough, right? That uh, it's it's not the uh, more judicial review of pardons. It's it's it, we gotta you got we gotta do more. Um, uh, maybe it's a more radical notion of uh, forgiveness, even. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out and have you react to it because I think there's a there's a more uh, modest reading of your book and maybe a more radical reading of your book. Well, we're living at a time of uh, turmoil. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the, it, more people coming to a reckoning of what has not been addressed in this country, the massive inequalities. Um, I believe in the use of the legal system. We are far from its ideals. And so I, I don't think I'm ducking the question to say that if we really want the ideals to be realized, there might need to be some larger changes than just at the margins. Um, and I'm fascinated to see that there are prosecutors and courts that are, for example, embracing restorative justice and saying, no, don't bring this case into the courtroom. Let's go to this other avenue where the community can sit together and come up with a future solution. My own view of forgiveness is not to forget wrongdoing and not to actually deny that there's wrongdoing. We, I think the, the norms themselves, the rules are very important. The question is what's the consequences? And can we have the consequences be ones that are constructive for the individual and the community going forward, um, which is uh, often not served by locking someone up for 20 years or by destroying their finances so that they and their family cannot live um, and so the tools of forgiveness, I think, can better realize and I, 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 the ideals of equality and freedom and justice, uh, if integrated with the legal system. 
Uh, there's but something I could ask you. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. No, there's so, there's something I've been I wanted to ask you uh, that came to mind as I was reading your book, which is um, what your what your feeling is about the o Obama administration's uh, handling of the 9/11 uh, torture program and the various atrocities. In other words, you know, President Obama very much ran on this platform um, and then executed the idea of of a kind of let's just turn the let's turn the page, let's close the chapter. There was an investigation, of course, right? The Senate. Uh, issued a report after after a very long investigation, which they did some documentation. So it suggests that there was a role that truth played and the administration was supportive of that. But there weren't other kinds of things that maybe some of the things that you talked about, like uh, requiring people to show remorse, uh, lawyer, lawyers and others who participated in the torture program. Uh, for example, um, uh, so, you know, one lawyer, very prominent one, uh, Bybee, who is uh, at OLC, is now a federal judge in the Ninth Circuit. Um, I was wondering what your reaction to that was, uh, given to given given this model of, of forgiveness that you discuss. Well, the Obama administration, I think, did a, a little more than you've said. The Obama administration also adopted uh, rules and executive orders uh, to forbid uh, the practices of extreme interrogation that had been deployed uh, following 9-11. Uh, Unfortunately, they have been suspended by the current administration. Uh, so I think that um, looking forward as a kind of solution for dealing with wrongdoing does involve law making, but if it's not made permanent, it's, uh, it can be dispensed with. I did at the time of the Obama administration take up the issue of the bankers and the mortgage foreclosure crisis. And I recommended to the administration that they have a truth and reconciliation commission. Again, I'm not sure how much is benefited to society to lock people up or to force contrition, but um, how about getting the truth and then having law reform so that the practices of really uh, uh, unjustifiable uh, uh, badgering of people to take out loans that they could never pay back with escalating interest, that that would not happen again. Uh, and I, while we did not have a truth commission about that, we did adopt certain financial regulations. I, I, I take a lot of uh, cues here from how the military has an after orders process. Let's learn from what happened and then feed that forward. How can we learn? And I think the legal system could do much more than that than we do right now. You think about it, the medical system really was not uh, successful until it, it, it too had empirical research. You know, before 1900, if you went to the hospital, your chances of dying were greater than if you didn't. But after that time with evidence-based medicine, you know, medicine is now superb. I think we should do that with law too. We should have evidence-based law. We should evaluate, is the law working? Are we achieving the ends? Are we reducing crime? Uh, are we actually making people more solvent and able to uh, run their businesses or pay their student loans? And if we're not, then maybe we need to change some of the rules. That's great. You know, one of the things we haven't touched on um, is the connection between uh, you know, your work about forgiveness uh, and my work on equality and, and these various concepts uh, and um, the idea of sort of resentment, right, and, and violence, because uh, I very much read your, your work as uh, a kind of a, a, a big warning for all of us, right, that we are a society that is on a path uh, where uh, we, we're engaged in a series of cycles of violence of various sorts. And if we don't find a way to break those cycles, even the smaller cycles, um, then we are um, at greater risk of falling apart, among other things. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 I wonder, um, because I've been reading your book has caused me to think more about uh, how much that affects the way I think about equality and uh, and dignity and fairness as well. And I, and I suppose uh, that has had an indirect effect on my work so far in the sense that um, the concern about backlash, the concern about uh, resentment um, uh, is, it, it figures in my work to the extent that I worry um, that uh, if we do things uh, terribly wrong now, 
we will be in a worse off uh, culture, we'll be in a worse off set of political arrangements, you know, tomorrow. Uh, and that will, that will erode these things that we say we care about, like equality and dignity, that backlash and the, and the politics of resentment will take us to a, a worse place where it will make our, our, our jobs harder. Um, uh, and I'm trying to figure out here um, how much in your work for, you know, for, forgiveness puts that at the center, whereas perhaps I, I just see it at the moment as primarily um, a big problem to be avoided. Uh, so interesting, you know, the, the, the risk that we, uh, in our righteous indignation at wrongs, try to create a world of permanent losers uh, is present. And we should not live in a world with permanent losers. That is not good for anyone, certainly not them, but not even for the winners. If, if we want a world where everyone can thrive, you know, I think you rightly link the ideal of equality to a sense of moral outrage and a sense of outrage at wrong treatment, at inequalities, at oppression. But the danger for any of us is that in our sense of righteousness, we then tip over into being the very thing that we despise. And we tip over into a boundless maybe vengeful approach. So yes, I'm very interested in coming up with avenues that are circuit breakers for what is justifiable outrage. The wellspring of a sense of justice is a sense of outrage. It is a sense of, of vengeance. I've been wrong, there should be a consequence. But if we are left to ourselves, we might let that uh, unfold without any limits. What law offers is a set of instruments, institutions and practices so that we're not alone with uh, our suffering or with our reaction to it. And it can be channeled and tamed and, and controlled and not have permanent winners and permanent losers. That's a wonderful place to stop. It was, a, it was a great to have this conversation with you about the connections between our, our two books and uh, congratulations on, on the publication of your book. Well, I, I feel emphatically the same way. I learned a great deal and I'm so grateful because your work makes me hopeful. <laughs>